is what is known about the Lorentz equation. This is I have taken from a more recent book, New Methods for Chaotic Dynamics, and I put the reference. All these are in the uh, Dropbox, and I've added a lot of articles uh, just last night. Okay, so. I will show you. I mean, it is a mystery. I just say this is a Lorentz equation. How how was this Lorentz equation derived? Okay, what are the ideas that go into its development? Of course, the original paper is there, but I will take another example and show you how this truncation from governing equations happens. Okay, so but for the moment, this is an equation that has been derived from the governing equations: conservation of loss or momentum, mass and energy. And this has three three parameters. So the parameter space is very rich. Okay, so R stands for something like a, a dynamical parameter, Rayleigh number, or heating rate. Sigma stands for Prandtl number, for example. And there is another parameter B. So if you fix all these values, you will get one solution. And this is a dynamical system. That solution will be unique for a given starting point. Okay. But what happens as, as and the knowledge on this problem is not complete yet, and it will never be complete, perhaps. Okay, because that is the nature of nonlinear problems. You cannot tell a priori how many solutions there are. Okay, and the, even steady state solutions. If you set the left hand side equal to zero, you get the steady state uh, solution map in the parameter space of sigma, p, and r. Okay. So what is known right now is a lot. And these are summarized in the two textbooks. One is by uh, Collins and the other one by these Russian guys. And the Russian guys have done a very nice job of summarizing. Okay, so there is the origin, that is x, y, z equal to zero is a steady state solution. And that remains, I mean, these are the terminology that they use, stationary solution, steady state solution. And they remain stable for, uh, I mean, they remain as a solution. For any value of the parameter, r, sigma, beta, whatever number you put in, that's a solution. Whether they are stable or not is a different issue. Okay, So it is stable. It is known that it is stable for r less than 1. How do you determine the stability? That's not very difficult. Okay, you, How many of you think you can do that problem if I just give you that assignment? <laughs> Maybe we should have an assignment. We should convert that into a course. <laughs> what do we do? If I ask you to determine the, yeah, you have to construct the three by three matrix, the Jacobian matrix, linearize this problem, and for the steady state, that is, after you construct the Jacobian, put x equal to y equal to z equal to zero, and see when the eigenvalues are going to switch from the left hand side to eigen, right hand side. Okay, and that means we're basically solving an eigenvalue problem, and uh, that determinant equal to zero and then you can go on solving this and that will have in it the three parameters sigma r and beta so you're going to get an algebraic equation and it is doable by hand because it's a three by three system right so set there find the determinant set the determinant equal to zero you get a set of cubic equation for the three eigenvalues but all the eigenvalues will depend on sigma r and beta okay so symbolically you can do that in uh, maple and so the, the critical points are known in terms of those parameters. Okay? So once r becomes greater than 1, there are two additional solutions that come up. These are the solutions. Again, they have been, these have been given in a very general form because it is possible to solve it even though it is nonlinear analytically. Okay? So no matter what value of b or r you put in there, you can find what the steady states are. So for r greater than 1, there are three steady states, 0, and then there are two other steady states, right? And the stability, of course, changes. Okay, that would be something like a pitchfork bifurcation. The r equal to 0 will become unstable. The other two will remain stable. So these are remain stable up to a critical value of rc, from r equal to 1 to rc. And rc depends on the other two parameters, sigma and b, in this fashion. So you pick a value of sigma, you put a value of b, Remember, these are parameters in the problem. You know what the critical value is. So you have a parameter space, a region, where you can identify where you will have one solution, where you will have three solutions, etc. Okay, And um, here they're talking about one-dimensional unstable manifold. What does that mean? We talked about there are three eigenvalues, so there are three eigenvectors. One of them is positive, the other two are negative. Okay, So in the state space, 
that steady state will have two eigenvectors which are attractors and one eigenvector which is a repeller. And that's basically I think what they are talking about when they say the, the separate tricks, these are the eigenvectors for example, issuing from the point O along its one dimensional unstable manifold. One dimensional unstable manifold simply means that there are, this is where you need the translation from math to something that we can understand, right. So it probably means basically there are one positive eigenvalue. The unstable manifold is a manifold consisting of all unstable modes, all unstable eigenvalues, whereas a stable manifold would be one consisting of all uh, negative eigenvalues. But all you need is the dimensionality of the unstable manifold to be at least one, then the whole system is unstable okay, uh, for any arbitrary uh, disturbance. And then what happens is, um, if you want to think of it as a sketch, let me try to plot, okay, I'm just picking one parameter, r, as a distinguished parameter, sigma and beta being some other finite parameter. So you have a steady state and then it bifurcates like that. And then at some point, these become unstable and you have some sort of a half bifurcation at that point. So you get a time periodic motion at another critical point. There are many, many critical points. So that's why I said the, the picture is never complete. Okay? But as you continue to increase, these now these are, what are they? They are limit cycles. Okay? And those two limit cycles will come and merge with each other, touch at a particular point, again at a critical value of r. Okay? And that give, changes the dynamics. So just beyond that, you will have the strange attractor. The strange attractor is basically the trajectory that goes around this for a while and then switches, go, goes around that for a while and switches and goes around like this. If you've seen that, have you seen the strange attractor dynamics in MATLAB? So that is basically the, so in certain region that happens. Now, if you ask the question, I am in that region, there are, are there other possible states, steady states or periodic states, the answer is really unknown because you can never completely know for a nonlinear problem what are the other states. So the continuation algorithms allow you to track and explore a certain region of the parameter space. Once you know one solution, you can continue to track and see how that solution branches off or how the solution turns around and that's a very powerful method. Okay, and that's what I wanted to talk about today. And uh, the picture is very complicated. As you can go further, we have kind of uh, identified between R1 and another critical point R2. Okay, there is a saddle periodic trajectory. That's the half bifurcation point. And if you go down, I think the but very high values of R, the chaotic state gives rise to gives back the periodic states. Okay. So you have windows of chaotic state, windows of periodic state. So it is a very complicated uh, dynamical behavior and we will never know the complete picture. I'm just taking all these, maybe you can just read through that. Um, but let me just talk about this idea of a continuation. That's a very powerful idea, an important idea. Um, that allows us to track in a more complicated problem. For three by three, we can do it, do a lot by analytical means. But if we have 10,000 by 10,000 equations, how many of equations, discretized, for example, how do we track these solutions? So the once we have a certain structure of the solution path. Then we can say, okay, how do we calculate the critical points? Okay, and those we use something called extended systems, knowing what the nature of the singularity is, we can expose that. But what is the basic idea? We are now looking at steady state solution. It's a set of nonlinear algebraic equations. So x could be a vector of time or 10,000. So you must have 10 or 10,000 functions. And they come from the results. And we will see what the ideas that are used for discretizing them. So by a solution to this, what I mean is that value of x that satisfies the function equal to zero. Okay? And that solution is going to depend on the parameter p. As I change the Reynolds number, I'll get different solutions. And that's what we want to construct. So we want to construct some norm of x against p, the parameter. Okay? 
So the parameter, so initially if you pick some parameter value and try to get a numerical solution for that, and then the path may go something like this. It may be very complicated. Who knows? Okay. So there may be carry points here that we need to calculate, or we may have a branch point from there. And is there a systematic way of hanging on to the rope as you, uh, if you like, and continuing on and see where that solution path leads to? How would you do that? Well, how would you solve the equation? It's an equation, right? Uh, there are many iterative methods, but one iterative method that's very powerful, which is also coupled to determining the stability, is the Newton method. All of you are familiar with the Newton method, right? It's basically it says plus one equals x n minus j inverse f j inverse f at x n. Have you not seen the Newton method before? Okay. The, the basic idea of the Newton method is the following. Okay. So, in a one-dimensional case, it's very easy to understand, but you're going to plot this function f as a function of x. You assume you have only one equation and one unknown. Okay. So, the way of solving it would be, I just pick a various values for x and then plot it. And this is the point I want. Okay. That is the solution what I want. Okay. And I'm going to make an arbitrary guess because I don't know what the solution is. And the guess is here. Okay, so what the Newton method does is, okay, if that is the guess, if you can also tell me what is the slope of the function at that point, I can take that slope and ask where does the slope intersect? So it's a linearization. So a nonlinear function, we are linearizing it, and then we are saying where does that linear approximation intersect the axis? Okay, and then I, of course, that is not going to be the correct solution, the function there is not going to be zero. So I take that as my next guess and then say, okay, where does this, the tangent approximation to that intersect? So I repeat that process. Okay. And so in the one dimensional case, it will simply be uh, x n plus 1 equals x n minus that divided by f prime. Okay. That is the function value at x n. And this comes from hitting a linear equation at the point that you have guessed. The generalization of this to a multi-dimensional case is this f prime is a Jacobian matrix. It is essentially contains the same information. The derivative of every one of the functions with respect to every one of the variables. Because it is the denominator, it becomes a J inverse, a matrix. And this becomes a vector. Okay. So that is the basic Newton method. Now, if you look at fluent. And other packages, they don't use Newton method. They use other kinds of iterative methods, such as relaxation and uh, uh, multi grid and variations on that. Uh, um, so, those iterative methods don't need Jacobian. It's calculating the Jacobian in large scale problems when you have 10,000 or 100,000 equations is a very time consuming task. So, people avoid it if they can. They can use an iterative method. Uh, that gives you the one result that you want. But if you can calculate that, then you can calculate the eigenvalues of that matrix. So the purpose of using J is multifold. It's not just to use the Newton method to get a converged result, but you can also probe the stability of that steady state because you have constructed the Jacobian, you just have to probe the eigenvalues. Of course, again, when you're dealing with 10,000 equations, you don't want to compute the entire 10,000 eigenvalues because that is also a time consuming process. So we can map the all eigenvalues into unit circle and look at those eigenvalues at SK, for example, the unit circle to determine stability. So the stability information is contained in the same matrix. Okay, J. Now the continuation method does one step further, say by by again making use of the Jacobian. Okay. What does a continuation method do? Suppose it assumes that you can get one solution. So you pick a particular value of the parameter. And you use the Newton method, you use the Newton method, iterate on it, and if it converges, then you have this starting point. Okay? Then I want to get the solution for the next value of the parameter. 
what, could, what can you do? One thing that we commonly do is take the previously converged result and give that as an initial guess because Newton method always requires an initial guess, right? So a previously converged result and give that as an initial guess and make your parameter change small enough, particularly if you're having convergence problems, okay? What that means in this particular context is I want to take this and give that as my initial guess and then I'm going to iterate again using Newton method to get from there to there. So remember, we talked about a region of attraction for uh, dynamical system. So the same thing applies. In the iterative method, there is a region of attraction you can think of for each iterative sequence. So if you are within that region of attraction, it will go to that solution in that, uh, it will go to the equilibrium point for the iterate. The iterative process itself can be unstable. We should talk about that uh, later on in a numerical methods course, we do cover that, okay. L like SOR, for example, successive over relaxation method can become unstable if you use a large relaxation factor, okay. That has nothing to do with the numerical stability. It is just a, I mean, it has nothing to do with the physical instability of the problem. It is purely a numerical consequence. So, you can control that by controlling the relaxation factor. But there is a theory that says Newton method is always guaranteed to converge with a catch. The catch is as long as you're close enough <laughs> to the solution, <laughs> right? So if you have a good initial guess, the Newton method is guaranteed to converge. It will converge quadratically. It will converge much faster. Quadratic means if the error is 10 to the minus 2, one step, next step will get you to 10 to the minus 4, next step 10 to the minus 8, etc. So in a few iterations, it will give you. Whereas the SOR and uh, uh, other methods will take maybe hundreds of thousands of iterations sometimes. So the idea is the simple continuation is one which we can all implement in, in Fluent and any other code because it simply says, give me the period of solution that's going to be my next guess. And I'm going to take this step small enough so that it still remains a good step. If I take this and give it as an initial guess for this, that's going to become a poorer guess for that solution. So I can load on this from, this is a simple continuation, okay. <laughs> There's something called the Euler-Newton continuation. <coughs> what does the Euler-Newton continuation do? It uses the same idea that the Newton method used. What did the Newton method do? It said, you give me a guess and I take a tangent and I approximate the curve by a linear function and then I ask where that linear function has a solution. I use that as a next guess, right? So if you can apply the same idea to Euler-Newton, uh, continuing this curve, Maybe I should kind of exaggerate that curve like this. I'm just exaggerating this part. Okay, so this is x and that is p. Convert solution for one value of p. Typically, p is a Reynolds number or some parameter in the problem. And when you, you can always find a region in the parameter space where the solution is almost linear. Okay, if Reynolds number is zero, for example, then it's not linear. So you'll have, you'll have no convergence problem because you know that there is a unique solution. You can get that. The initial solution you can always get by controlling the parameter P into the, into the linear regime. And then you increase the nonlinearity. And what you do is, okay, what is this tangent vector represent physically? It represents the rate of change of the solution, actually if you use the norm, it's actually here, I'm just plotting it as a norm, but it's a vector with respect to the parameter P. So if I can get this vector, if I can get that vector, that will give me, and then I multiply this by my delta step in the parameter, that will give me the change that I should apply to the simple continuation idea. The simple continuation idea will tell me the best guess that I can find is here. The Euler-Newton continuation will tell me the best guess I can find is here. So I need to be able to calculate this vector, dx dp. That is, geometrically what it means is if I put out the parameter p, I should be able to know how fast each one of the solutions change with respect to that parameter. What is the slope? What is the rate of change of the solution vector x with respect to p. How can I get that? I can get that. That information is contained in this problem. 
I can get that from there. Okay? But simply taking the derivative of that entire function with respect to P. Okay? So if I take the derivative of this function with respect to P, what would I get? Euler <coughs> Newton. Okay. So I need to take the derivative of x with respect to p. That means I need to take. Remember, x depends on x, but x depends on p. But f also directly depends on p. It appears as a parameter in the equation. So it impl it, it depends through x implicitly, but it also depends explicitly on p. So when I take the derivative. plus df dt equal to 0. All I'm doing is I'm taking the derivative of that function with respect to the parameter p. But what is df dx? That is the same as the Jacobian that you have already constructed at that point, at the converged point. So you have a converged solution, so you evaluate the Jacobian of the converged solution that contains the rate of change information. And df dp, what is that? That's the derivative of the function with respect to p. So it looks like there is a mystery there, right? <laughs> you understand how, how you would do that? df dp? You need to go back to the equation and take the derivative of the function with respect to that equation. Yeah, maybe an example like that. You can all calculate j, right? You know how to calculate j. What I'm saying is, and j has already been calculated and used in the new context, right? So once it's converged, I have a converged j evaluation at the converged point. So I have this, and I want to get the xdp. So that's what the vector I want, okay? But in order to do that, I need to get what this one is. And I get that by taking the derivative of the function with respect to p. Okay, let's go back to the <coughs> this equation. Okay, so you know how to calculate the Jacobian. Okay, so it's going to be, for example, df1 dx is going to be minus sigma. Okay, df2 d sorry df2 yeah let's do that df2 dx should go actually in the second one. What did I do? It's going to be x is simply r. So you need to calculate all these derivatives. And when I say df with respect to dp, I need to identify which parameter I'm going to continue. There are three parameters in this case. Suppose the parameter that I'm continuing is equal to r. Then all I need is taking the derivative of this function with respect to r. So df dp will be a vector. <coughs> okay, from the first equation, you will say, what is the derivative? Zero, exactly. What is the derivative with respect to zero? Simply x at that steady state. At that steady state. Okay. And r appears only there. That's it. So if you are continuing with respect to sigma, you will do the same thing. So the, the path in the parameter space could actually be going in three different directions. Whether continuing in r, in p, or in sigma. But calculation of this derivative vector is actually not very difficult because we have the original function. So you can take the derivative with respect to that. <coughs> so that is a known quantity. So what do I do at this stage? In order to get my vector, all I need to do is rearrange this equation as dx dp, the unknown vector, as equal to minus j inverse multiplied by df dp, which is a vector. Okay, It's a vector function because f is a vector function, but p is a scalar, one parameter, continuing with respect to what parameter p. Yeah. In the first one? Yes. Because all I'm doing is I'm taking the derivative of that equation. So I'm applying the chain rule. Okay. So I'm saying that 
F changes, F depends on both X and P. So if I change P, F will directly change because P appears in that equation. And that part is what is captured in this equation. That part of the equation. P changes, F changes. How fast I can get from this. Okay. And the second one is when I change P, it changes X implicitly. But X changes F. That's where I use the chain rule to say that what is the change of X with respect to P? And then I multiply that by what is the rate of change of F with respect to X? And that gives me, so essentially, what does this equation say? This equation says F is equal to 0. So if I take the derivative of F, that must also be equal to 0. Right? The derivative of that function with respect to anything that I take should be equal to 0. In this case, I'm taking with respect to P. So it's a summation. It's a sum of changes coming from directly from changing P and indirectly from changing P to X and then X on F. Make sense or no? They You, you still are not convinced, right? Um, okay, let's take an example. Let's maybe maybe yeah. one of you can write it into the, yeah, just to get the DF. Okay. So DF should be equal to uh, DF DX, then DX plus DF DP, DP, that's correct. Then DY DP. You want to this equation, divided by dp, so you get this Okay, let's make up an example. Let's make up an example and see whether we understand that or not. So I'm going to take x cubed plus 5p equal to 0. That is my nonlinear equation. Okay, so this, this has x in it and it has p in it. Okay, and I'm asking you to, ca so you, you can, let's even make it simpler, I guess, x squared minus 5p, <laughs> so that I can actually analytically solve it, okay? The idea is the same, okay, x squared minus 5p equal to minus 25p, <laughs> okay? So what is x? x is equal to plus or minus 5 square root of p, okay? So I ask you now to plot f. Okay, as a function of p, when I change p by a small amount. Okay, when I change p by a small amount. So, you f I first give you uh, <coughs> p is equal to 1. So, you put that here. You get the x and you get the x and p. You put p equal to 1 and you put the corresponding x. And, of course, that's going to satisfy that equation. Okay, and that gives you an f. Now, I say, how does f change when I change p? Okay, so I change p from 1 to 2 or 1 to 1.1. Okay, so the p is going to change because, uh, I mean, the function f is going to change because of two reasons. Okay, one is I've changed p directly. Instead of 1, it is 1.1 now. So there is going to be a contribution to changes in f. This is what I want to calculate, the change in f. Okay, f equal to 0 and I want to calculate df. The df changes through two mechanisms. One is a direct change in P. The other one is the change 1.1 I have to put here and I will calculate a new F and put that F in there. Okay. So if I'm doing it numerically, I, I can see that I need to manipulate two places to capture the consequence of changing P on F. So the Consequence of changing p appears in two locations. One is directly where the function p, the parameter p appears in the equation, and indirectly through the solution. Okay, because the solution depends on p. Okay, so that's essentially what chain rule in calculus tells you how to do. When you have an implicit function, a function of a function, you can take the derivative of the function with respect to the first variable and then with respect to the second one. Right? You need to think about it. Review chain rule in calculus, and that will uh, do it very clearly. In, in thermodynamics, you must have come across all these, like enthalpy, entropy, or functions of two-state variables, pressure and temperature. Okay, so if I have 
u as a function of t and p, and I want to calculate what is the change in u du. How do I do that? I do that by saying du changes with respect to temperature, dt, plus du changes with respect to pressure, dt, right? It's the same idea. So a function that changes depends on two variables. And I want to calculate what is the total change in the function due to either change in t or change in p. So I just find out what is the partial variation with respect to t and what is the partial variation with respect to uh, t. It's the same idea. The only difference is now t itself is an implicit function of t. And apply the chain rule on that. Okay. That's what we are facing with here. So you need to think about it uh, uh, to make sure that uh, now you understand it, you recall it. Okay. So getting back to the Euler-Newton continuation, um, so now we know how to get that tangent vector, how to get the tangent vector. So what do we do to get this value? All I need to do is use the Taylor series expansion. X is equal to x at p plus df dp times delta p. These are all vectors. Okay, the delta p is a scalar, but df dp is a vector that we just calculated from that using the same information that is contained in the Jacobian with one extra matrix vector multiplication. Now, this is where the efficiency would come. What you need to do is, if you're dealing with 100,000 equations and you want to invert J, you don't want to invert J once for the Newton method and again repeat it again for this. So you do the LU decomposition once and store it, okay? And then it becomes a simple vector matrix multiplication, a very simple inexpensive operation that gives you uh, the net change. Sorry, this is dx, dx dp. That's that one. <clears throat> okay, that's essentially Taylor series. <clears throat> Does the idea of a continuation make sense? Now, I don't think Comsol implements Euler Newton. I think it probably implements simple continuation. Okay, but you, the, the parameter continuation is available as an option. Now, the question that you need to ask at this stage is, okay, we know we have now a powerful tool for continuing, and if the solution does this, turns around, okay? So I am here, and I calculated my tangent vector, and the tangent vector is coming like this, and I'm taking a delta p to go from here to the next step. And it turns out that there is no solution in the neighborhood. This would happen when you have a limit point, okay, a simple turning point, okay, in your solution. So the Newton method would fail because you don't have a good initial gas. Now, it might happen that if you the solution does this and there is another steady state solution to the problem, if you give a lot of iterations for the Newton method because this is a poor guess for that, it might jump. And you might then get accidentally a solution there. And then you might continue on and you'll get a picture like this. So you might get a picture that looks like that. Something like this. What has happened is the solution has jumped at that particular value because your tangent vector gave that as an initial gas and jumped to that. When that happens, you can say, okay, something. If there is a singular point in the neighborhood, okay? Then you would say, okay, I'm going to start this and go back and see whether I jump at the same place or I jump at a different place. That's easily done because all you need to do is change the sign of x p minus delta p equals x at p minus dx dp delta p. Because what you're doing at any particular point is you're calculating the tangent vector. You can choose to go forward or you can choose to go backward and generate the good gas. So if you are here and if you are coming back, just take that vector and see whether it goes and jumps somewhere else. If that happens, you have 
some sort of a hysteresis behavior with respect to that parameter. And it also tells you that there is very likely an intermediate solution that does like this. That may change stability because at this turning point, we know that there is an eigenvalue that changes sign. Okay. In fact, that is a condition that we would use to precisely locate where that point is. All we can do with the Euler Newton continuation is you approach that point to somewhat and then you jump across and you know exactly what the resolution would be the belt epi that you would use. So you would know the location of a singular point within that resolution of belt epi. Okay? Any questions? So practically when you're when you're doing this, it, if you just set it up as a Solution, or do you implement some kind of limit on the amount that it can drop? Stop yourself and then know when to go backwards, or is this uh, post once you have the this plot up there with the gap between? Um, how, how you, 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 can, you can program it in different ways. Okay. If you see a jump, I mean, the, you, you, you don't want to put a bound on the y axis. Because the solution could be beyond that. Yeah. But you can say put a bound on your delta t. Okay. And the automatic step size control is essentially does that. Okay. says initially I'm going to take a delta p and march. And if it fails to converge in 25 iterations or something, I take back to the previous one, take a smaller step, okay. and take a smaller step. By implementing that, you will arrive at, converge at that similar point. But it doesn't give you a way of getting across it. In order to get across it, you need to say, OK, I'm going to give Newton method 200 iterations and see whether it finds anything in the neighborhood or not. If that fails, you don't have any other tool. Sorry, I'm going to give you the next tool that will <laughs> tell you how to turn around. Because when this happens, most likely there is a path that is turning around, how to turn around. And this is a very powerful idea called the arc continuation. All these came out in the 70s and 80s. I think a Russian mathematician had this idea in the 50s, Davidenko, but uh, this method is attributed to Keller uh, from Caltech, I think. And the idea is very simple. Okay, I have a set of equations. Let me just erase these. And maybe, yeah, I'll just discuss the idea and then uh, we will stop. Again, at 10 o'clock, I have these meetings with the seminar speakers. <laughs> Okay, so the arc length continuation is the following. I have x p equal to 0. That is my equation. Why should I specify p as a constant and then solve for x? When I do that, I get into this difficulty. Okay. So the idea is, why can't I treat p as an unknown? That means I have an extra degree of freedom. Right? Originally, I had n equations in n unknowns in x, and p was treated as a constant. Now I'm making p as a variable unknown variable. I have an extra degree of freedom. So I can try to construct, impose an extra degree of constraint to reformulate the problem. And the idea is I'm going to reparameterize the problem, not keeping p as a constant, but p as a variable, but a measure of the distance from the current solution to the next solution, that is the length along the arc. That's why it's called the arc length continuation. Okay. So I, I have to propose a measure of that distance, and I specify that distance, which simply says, if I am somewhere around here and I'm at this point, I'm at this point, it doesn't say find me a solution along the tangent vector with respect to P. It says find me a solution that is in the neighborhood of a certain length measured along that. Okay. So if I am turning around and here and I specify my delta S, the solution may be at that point. But Okay, another way of saying that, I guess, is if I fix P as right at this certain point, why does the method fail? Because, of course, one way of understanding is there is no other solution in the neighborhood. But what happens to the Jacobian in the Newton method? It becomes singular. Why does it become singular? The stability changes. The eigenvalue goes to zero. If the Jacobian is singular, you cannot invert that, right? So how can I reformulate the problem in such a way that the problem is regular? It doesn't have the singularity, okay? And that's what the Arkland continuation does. So instead of this, we will say I have f x as a function of s 
p as a function of s equal to 0. s is a new parameter, p is an unknown, and this new parameter is a measure of the length along that arc. Okay? So I need to have a new equation, and that equation is going to be n as a function of x s, p s, and s equal to 0. We will add a new equation. Okay? How does that new equation look like? This equation is given to us. And in fact, there is no s explicitly in it. There is only s appears implicitly. Okay? <clears throat> but in this equation, s appears explicitly because we need to control the arc length. Okay? So how can you measure an arc length? One way of doing that is basically use the idea of measure distance uh, uh, minus x naught square reading function p minus p naught square plus s minus s naught square equal to zero. What does that equation remind you of? Distance between two points, if w1 and w2 are 1, for example, it's a Pythagoras theorem kind of a thing. Okay. What is the differential distance between these two points? So what would be x naught, p naught, s naught? Your reference point. That would be your center. Like you have already solved for that, so you know you are x naught, you know you are p naught, and you set s naught equal to zero because you're starting to measure from that point. And then you put s for a value. The problem now becomes well posed. The Jacobian of this extended system is now not singular anymore. That is a theorem that proves Kenner, I think. And the mathematicians work out the theory behind it. Okay. So it's a very powerful method. All you need to do is add one additional equation to your 10,000 equation. It doesn't increase your workload anymore. Okay, and uh, it gives you a powerful way of continuing that. And if yeah, <laughs> good question. Very good question. Because is the solution unique? You can ask that question. Okay. So here I have my current solution, and I'm saying find me a solution at an arc length delta s from there. Obviously, there are two solutions: one on the right side, one on the other side. The solution is not unique, right? All we are specifying is a delta s. There is one on the forward path, and there is one on the reverse path. Okay. So it might jump into the one on the reverse path. But the other question that you are asking is the Forward solution is an unstable path. So is that going to cause the method to fail? That's a very good question. It doesn't. Why? Newton method will converge to unstable solutions. Newton method is guaranteed to converge. Okay. So th that's one way of getting all the unstable solutions. You may not experimentally, physically be able to realize that, but you can compute that. So what because we they are. When we get to the turning point, we use the arc length, and then we switch back to the no, 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 no. Now you still need to construct a way of solving this extended system. N plus 1 equation. So you use Newton method on the extended system. We will see how to do that maybe in the next class. Okay. So and that extended Newton method, Newton method applied on these coupled equations will converge whether the original solution is stable or unstable. And uh, we will see how to set that matrix, the extended Jacobian matrix, etc. in the next class, I think. That guy may be in my office, so I better stop here. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have much time to discuss. I think you should interrupt me while I'm doing this. <laughs>